How many of you all remember Joe Diffie? Okay, I do. Maybe some of the younger guys don't, but I remember Joe Diffie, one of my favorites. Um, how many of you all know our native son, Jason Aldean? Okay, his music, 1994. All right. When I hear that music, I think of one thing. Okay, when I hear that song, 1994, I think of white mold. And I'm going to tell you why. And my goal in this talk, as we go through here, is hopefully you know Joe Diffie at some point. Hopefully you know Jason Aldean. But my point is, every time the song 1994 comes on the radio, you all are thinking white mold and white mold control, and you're doing what you can do. Okay? I told my daughter that I was going to sing that song to you this morning, and she was clear that her social life in Tiff County would be over if I did that. <laughs> And so I will not do that. But what I will tell you is that white mold is the number one disease we continue to face in southeastern peanut production. Every year, white mold can be, is a problem in some fields. It's not the only important disease, but white mold or southern stem rot, whatever you want to call it, is a critical factor. And we spend millions of dollars to manage it, and we're continuing to lose millions of dollars to white mold every year. In 1994, in 1994, at the peak of Joe Diffie's career, we had a godsend as far as peanut production went. It was the proverbial game changer. And that was Ted Biconazole then sold as Folicure was labeled. 1994, I believe, was also the year of the big flood in Albany. Okay? 1994 was a critical year because with the release of Folicure, it changed how we managed white mold. And soon after that, Azoxy Strobe and Rebound came in 1995, and Moncut came in that same amount of period. In fact, Moncut might have come a little bit earlier, but the price kept it out of the ball game. But 1994 was a critical year for how we managed white mold. It changed everything. What I'm going to talk about from now on is how we've changed since 1994. Because like that song says, hey, Joe, but we're not 1994 anymore. We're not growing peanuts and managing white mold like we did 20 years ago. A huge difference between 1994 and 1974, unbelievable difference, but between 2014 and 1994, equally big. And what I want you to know, what I want you to walk away with, remember 1994 song, think about your white mold control, but let's think and put in perspective what tools we have now and how you can deploy them. Tim Brenham and Albert Colbreth have also been critical components, critical team players in developing this. What I present, a lot of it's what they've developed. I gave a presentation at one time where I used the Jolly Green Giant for giant steps in peanut production. And you're going to see that Jolly Green Giant in some of these slides from a previous presentation I made. Those, in my opinion, were giant steps that were made in peanut production and disease management since 1960. Smaller steps would put sprout in there. So if you see the Jolly Green Giant, that's a big step. Sprout's a smaller but, more, but an important step as well. Maybe not readily adopted. Maybe not as important as a giant step, but if you see those, that's what those mean. Bravo. Bravo came out in the early 1970s. It was a game changer as far as leaf spot control went. But as we were able to keep the leaves on the peanut crop, what became more and more of a problem? Prior to Bravo, prior to keeping leaves on, white mold was not a huge problem. But now that we can keep that foliage, now that we can keep the crop healthier, white mold has exploded over our lifetime as far as importance. 1969, 1969, you can read up there what our opportunity was. Deep plowing, flat or raised beds, control circospor release, but use a PCNB. That was what we could do to control white mold in 1969. Since then, we found that traditional leaf spot materials like Bravo, certainly been late, makes white mold worse. So what we did in controlling leaf spot is we created more and more of a problem with white mold. Up until 1994, up until 1994, one of our opportunities to manage white mold was Lohr's ban, an insecticide, Mark, as you know. You talked about Lohr's ban. That was what we had, that was what we used. And so that's why in 1994 we had a game change when tebuconazole, then azoxystrobin, and flutolanil became available. Okay? So the rest of the talk is, what tools do we have since then? What's changed since 1994? What should growers today in 2014, going into the 2014 season, what should you be thinking about deploying, at least considering the use of, that's changed since Folicure came out? Okay? In this slide, I'm showing you what some of the management strategies are. And those in the first ones, the rotations. 
uh, plant more resistant varieties, choose the appropriate fungicide program. That really hadn't changed. The basic foundation hasn't changed since 1994. But what has? What are some of the factors it has? Well, one of those is peanut RX, or our risk index. Started out as a spotted wood index, and now it includes white mold. I don't have the book up here, but we have the peanut updates available at all your county production meetings. The companies that are here, Sagina, BASF, Sipchem, Arista Life Science, Bear Crop Science, DuPont, they all have their prescription fungicide programs where they will have cards like this where you can look at the risk index. That's changed. That's changed since 1994. What it allows you to do is take all the components like rotation, our new varieties, your seed spacing, your planting dates, and see how they affect white mold. We have better education for you, the grower, to decide. If nothing else, do me a favor and look at this. Look at this and say, how can I improve? What are my production factors that I can improve upon to reduce the baseline of white mold? Breeding for resistance. At one time, it was a dream. As early as 19, as recently as 1969, you used the word unfortunately when you talked about resistance of any kind as far as diseases went. We've gotten more and more resistance to tomato spot and wilt virus. We're getting more and more resistance to leaf spot diseases. We had some early, the DP1, the MDR98. If you remember Joe Diffie, you remember those varieties as well. They had problems, they went away. But the good news is our breeders continue to bring varieties to the table for us. And one of these that's been updated in Peanut RX for 2014 is Georgia-12Y, okay? You've heard me talk about Georgia-7W for having white mold resistance. Georgia-12Y is better and higher yield potential, okay? So when you use the risk index, you can look at the varieties that are available and you can see how their resistance compares to favorites like Georgia Green or Georgia-06G. So one thing has changed, we're getting new varieties with resistance, and another thing has changed is we put them into a system known as Peanut RX that allows you, the grower, to come up with an improved strategy for white mold control. Tapiconazole is still out there. I still call it Folicure. My hand gets slapped every time I do it because there is no Folicure, is there? All right? But Tebiconazole or Folicure, whatever you want, it's still out there. And it's available at a bargain price. That's a problem for me. In some ways, it's a good problem. We have the opportunity to use soil-borne fungicides out there. There's not a grower in this room who does not need to treat for white mold, and using tebiconazole may be a good option, and it may be the best option in some of your dry land situations. The problems are is we're overusing it. Why use 7.2 ounces when you can put out 21 or 14, 14 or 21 ounces? Why well, spray four times when I can spray seven times cheaper than I could spray Bravo 10 years ago? Okay? The problem is we're overusing chemistry, overusing a class, and the more important thing for the growers is you may make more money spending more money. A fungicide, that these new fungicides that are out there may be better for white mold in a tough situation. They are better. You're missing the opportunity if you simply look at what you've always done. What's Philip Roberts say? If you always do what you've always done, you always get what you always got. Okay? So if you stick with what you did in 1994 only, that's what you'll get. Here's the fungicides that are out there now. The white mold fungicides. And a couple of these... I'm not going to even use that. I don't know what button to press. But here, Preaxor, your friends from BASF will be talking more and more about that. Custodia. Custodia you may not have heard of. That's from Mana. It's a combination of azoxystrobin, which is sold as a bound now, and tebuconazole. But all of these fungicides are available. Okay? Maybe they're not all the appropriate fungicide used all the time, but they are available and they have changed. They continue to offer us improved white mold control. We've also got prescription fungicide programs. In 1994, you were told to begin spraying your peanuts approximately 30 days after planting, earlier if it was raining, stay on a 14-day schedule, and finish up after seven to eight fungicide applications. That's what Extension said, that's what consultants said, and that's certainly what the companies said. Since that time, with research that's been supported by the Georgia Peanut Commission and by you, the growers, Every company that's here represented today that's selling fungicides, the Cooperative Extension, our consultants all recognize that there are different levels of disease ris uh, risk in a field. And all of these companies will say if you're at a high risk for white mold, you better spray at least seven times. 
But if you're at low risk for white mold, these companies, your consultants, cooperative extension, say you can spray as few as four times. Donald Chase, our moderator, 2010, I think it was 2010, had the top yields in the state. He and his father had the top yields in the state, and I believe he sprayed four times for white mold control that year. Okay? I don't have to prove it to Donald, but we've got the data if you want to see it. New since 1994. One thing that's not changed since 1994, we got more fungicides than I ever thought we would. We've got better fungicides than I ever thought we would. But one thing that has not changed is since 1994, 5, and 6 in that area with the Moncut, the Folicure, and the Abound is we do not have a new class of chemistry. They all either fall into the Triazole class, the QOI Strobilurin class, or the SDHI class. We've got better chemistries, we've got new chemistries, but we have the same classes. Why is that important? Because we have to protect what we have. Because too much use in any one class, we've already seen resistance develop to Folicure or Tebiconazole and Leaspot, too much the whole class is threatened. One of the most important things that will happen in 2014 for peanut growers is that a Zoxystrobe, and currently sold, is a bound will go off patent. And I don't know that that's a good thing. Growers paying for the azoxystrobin, and you may think it is, but I don't. Because azoxystrobin is extremely sensitive to resistance development. It's off patent in China since 2010. Do you think they're going to wait to be producing it? No, they're not. They're producing it. Okay? It's one of our most important classes, not only in peanuts, but in other crops as well. And resistance develops fairly early, easily. And if we develop resistance to azoxystrobin in our peanut fields, those are the other fungicides that can take a hit. Since 1994, we've had the strobilurin chemistry brought to peanut farmers. In 2014, that strobilurin chemistry will go off patent, azoxystrobin. And if we misuse it in 2014 and beyond, these are the chemistries that are at risk. Let's not do it. Let's practice good resistance management. Another thing since 2014, we used to put dusts out. I didn't, but I'm sure some of you in the room remember putting dusts out for fungicides. We've talked about using granular lores, man. We talked about now we've got liquid formulations. One of the most difficult things in controlling white mold or any peanut disease is how do you get through a dense canopy when our target's the crown of the plant? How do we do that? Okay, 1994, we broadcast our sprays. We went out and sprayed when it was time to spray every 14 days. Used flat fan tips or hollow cone tips. We increased our pressure to try and get it down in. When you look at the peanut canopy, if your target is the crown of the plant and not the top of the plant, you know as well as I do what the damage is and what the potential is for white mold to come in. You keep the leaves on with Bravo, that's a good thing, but how are we going to control the white mold? Spraying peanuts at night, what is the purpose? Why would it work better? The main reason is at nighttime, those leaves are folded up, you get better spray deposition. You get the fungicide of the crown of the plant. We weren't even thinking about this in 1994, weren't thinking about it in 2004, okay? Not only do you get better deposition, but when those leaves open up during the daytime, they are protecting the fungicide you put there from ultraviolet degradation. If you don't want to get up early or stay up late, as far as the fungicide, that's okay. But since 1994, we can get the product where it needs to go. And again, research funded by your Georgia Peanut Commission. And yield differences between daytime and nighttime spraying in some fields have been 1,000 pounds per acre. I'm not promising you that, but that's worth thinking about. In this chart from Tim Brenneman, you can see in yellow, those are evening sprays. Red is morning sprays. Before the sun comes up, black is daytime sprays. Spraying in the early morning when you got due for further redistribution is your best opportunity. Do I care if you spray at night or not? I don't care. But I want you to know that since 1994, that's an option. We'll go spray at night. You'll spray at night if the disease is severe enough or the incentive is great enough. Okay. 2012, this is peanut prescription programs from Bear Crop Science. And we've circled a couple applications there because in 1994, when did we begin our fungicide programs for white mold? 60 days after planting. We still do that. In Levy County, Anthony, we were starting at 45 days with Tom Kucherik. Okay? But the point is the same. A little bit earlier, a little bit later, that's when we did. 
But as of 2011, 2012, now we're starting to recommend that growers have a white mold problem, we start earlier. Why? A new innovation. Do you have to? No, you don't. But spraying young plants sets the foundation down, whether you're spraying proline in a band, you're spraying a bound in a band, it sets the foundation for a white mold program. And what we have seen is when white mold's severe, you get season-long benefits from doing that. Now it's easy for me to stand up here and talk about that. It's easy for me to say you need to put a six inch band over 21 day old peanuts or a 10 inch band over twin rows. When you're going three to six miles an hour in a field, that's not easy. But the opportunity is there. And if nothing else, if nothing else, and especially with the cost of fungicides like Ted Buchan is all know, why wait until 60 days? 60 days, start your big program, I would certainly have a fungicide broadcast program out there earlier than that, even if it's mixed with your least spot sprays. This is one of our most famous, Tim's most famous pictures. On the left you see white mold, Let's see on the left you see white mold where he did not put the early emergence out, on the right where he did. Early emergence applications three to five weeks after planting, banded application can be very important. What about 2013? We know that diseases are based upon your host, your peanut crop, your white mold pathogen in the environment. And we know that we predicted that white mold would be severe last year because of the rainfall. I predicted, I'll take the blame, I predicted, okay? What we know is it was not as severe. We still saw benefits from going out with those early emergence applications, but if you look at the uh, high temperatures for 2010, 2011, and then look at 2013, the coolness of last year really precluded much early season white mold. We still saw benefits to an early emergence application, but because of the cool temperatures, not as much as we would have expected. So if you're a grower in this room thinking you've got a white mold situation, you're thinking about using early emergence applications, you look at the strategy for putting it out, and you anticipate or look at what the weather patterns are. Cooler season, cooler early season means you probably won't have much of an early season white mold problem. I would avoid the treatment there or maybe delay it. Hot temperatures like we had in 2011, that's where treatment like that shines. If, look at it, three and four. If you want to stop early season white mold, if you've had a problem with white mold, you're not set up or you don't think you need to do that early emergence application or in furrow application, absolutely, you've got the tools now, we've got the cost of tebuconazole. Regardless of what you're putting out there, at 45 days, 40 days, let's start a white mold program and bring the big guns, the more powerful, the newer fungicides in. Those since 1994, bring those in at your four block or your two block or whatever your program is at 60 days. Okay? If you're anticipating a tremendous amount of white mold or you've had a problem, that's where that early emergence application can really be a benefit. And I'm not trying to sell it to you. I don't care. But I can tell you that you've seen the pictures, the yield potential benefit in doing that makes it worth the headaches in finding a way to do it. So, white mold since 1994. Hey, Joe. Okay? By the red asterisks, every grower in the room in there, I think if there's three asterisks there, you should be looking at it, you should be using it. Peanut RX, I have no doubt. Prescription fungicide programs, there's good growers in the room who say, I'm happy with what I'm doing, Bob can talk about it, I'm glad we did the research, but I feel better spending seven sprays. That's fine, but at least be aware of what your risk is and what you can do. New and improved fungicides. If you cling only to what we had in 1994, you're missing opportunity. Nothing wrong with it, but you're missing opportunity. Every grower should think about that. More resistant varieties. 12Y for white mold problems. It's not perfect, but let's think about it. Let's look about employing these new varieties. Timing of application. Nighttime sprays and early emergence sprays, those work very, very well. Do you need them? And the last thing is that broadcast application. All of you can start your white mold programs early. Okay.